the students here are practicing a method of East Asian hand-to-hand -hand combat that has been passed down through many generations and has seen a growing level of interest in the Western world since the 1960s. This is the scene that comes to mind when people hear the term martial arts. Most people are unaware of the complex traditions of martial arts that existed in Europe during the Middle Ages. The height of the European Middle Ages was from around 1100 to 1500 AD, a time characterized by feudal kings and armored knights. Throughout Western Europe, these warriors dedicated their lives to the art of combat. Hollywood has traditionally portrayed medieval combat as nothing more than contests of brute force. But in reality, privileged youths of the time were taught refined fighting techniques by experienced masters. These masters were well versed in a number of weapons and combat styles. Aside from taking on students, a few of these masters documented their techniques in handwritten books. These manuscripts, sometimes written in poetic couplets, included elaborate illustrations and detailed discussions of the techniques of combat. While it is still unclear why these manuscripts were written, it is evident that they were an integral part of martial tradition particularly in Germany. The German materials are tremendously important to anybody who tries to study the medieval martial arts today, chiefly because the Germans wrote about these things much more than anybody else did. Prior to 1500, we have maybe about two dozen known manuscripts coming out of the German-speaking regions of Europe. By contrast, Italy comes in a very distant second with only three. So there's a lot of material for us to work with. And even the things that were written after 1500 are relevant to us. There are as many manuscripts again in the period after 1500. And these continue to preserve medieval traditions of combat arts, even in a time of the Renaissance when the traditional weapons are no longer of the same kind of practical use. A martial arts teacher in late medieval Germany had to pass practical tests of mastery, much as craftsmen had to prove their skill to a craft guild. The master could then take on students, teaching them various forms of both unarmed and armed combat. Practice of the martial arts was recognized as a healthy form of exercise, but it could also serve a practical purpose in preparation for judicial duels, self-defense, and warfare. One of a knight's most essential skills was wrestling a discipline built on balance, leverage, and timing, principles which make up the very fundamentals of all forms of combat. In all of wrestling, there should be three things. The first is skill. The second is quickness. The third is the proper application of strength. Medieval wrestling involved techniques that parallel those from all around the world. Wrestlers exploited balance, timing, and leverage to achieve a single goal, total control of the opponent, by any means necessary. One of the greatest benefits of wrestling was that it taught principles and techniques that could be applied to all weapons. Dagger combat was very similar to unarmed combat, with the dagger essentially acting as an extension of the arm. During the Middle Ages, virtually all men carried daggers, serving both for self-defense and as versatile tools. In a typical dagger contest, the individual who was able to land the first blow was the victor, often with a fatal outcome. Despite the advantages offered by the use of daggers, unarmed combatants were not defenseless against attackers wielding daggers. While wrestling was a fundamental skill for all forms of close combat, students required education in a range of weapons in order to become well-rounded fighters. Quarterstaff combat was another basic style taught by masters. 
Staff weapons such as the spear, halberd, and poleaxe were based on the techniques of the simple quarterstaff. The quarterstaff was basically a wooden pole about 8 feet long with blunt ends. This weapon was favored in training due to its simplicity and its ability to inflict non-lethal injuries. Quarterstaff fighters typically began by keeping their distance and jabbing with the tip of the staff at the opponent's face. This was often accomplished by prompting the opponent into an attack, then parrying and attacking to his face. When this was not enough, one could use a variety of follow-up techniques, including throws and attacks with the butt end of the staff, to get the chance for that winning strike. The emblematic weapon of the knight was the sword. Like staff weapons, medieval swords had many different forms. The sword favored most by knights toward the end of the Middle Ages was the longsword. The average blade length of the longsword was around 3 feet and the weapon weighed from 3 to 5 pounds. The longsword was one of the most versatile weapons of the period as it could be used on horse or on foot. With one hand or two, and it could be used like a spear, war hammer, or even a dagger, depending on the way it was held. The most basic attacks in sword combat consisted of cuts, slices, and thrusts. Cuts were sweeping attacks aimed at the mid to upper body. Slices used the base of the blade against the lower arms and wrists of the opponent and either attempted to make cuts on the arm or push through the opponent's defense. Thrusts were mostly aimed at the opponent's head and served as both an opening attack and a counterattack. A skilled swordsman would utilize every part of the weapon. A pommel bash could be executed to stun an opponent, and the so-called murder stroke turned the sword around to use the crossguard as a war hammer. All of these weapon forms converged in armored combat, which incorporated elements of sword and staff fighting, dagger, and wrestling. Fighting in plate armor altered some of the basic parameters of combat. A person wearing plate armor was protected against cuts and slashes, but vulnerable in the gaps between the plates. The best places to attack an armored man are through the harness, namely under the face, under the armpits, in the palms of the hands, on the arms from behind, into the gauntlets, into the hollows of the knee, below on the soles of the feet, in the insides of the elbows, between the legs and anywhere the harness has articulations. Because of the increased accuracy needed to hit these openings in the armor, long swords were held with the main hand on the hilt and the secondary hand on the middle of the blade. The armored combatant was essentially taught to use a longsword as a spear. Students would be taught to attack from either a high guard or a low guard. They would use a series of thrusts and parries to get in close and penetrate a weak point in the armor. Masters would also teach students how to attack with the hilt of the sword, delivering a powerful jab or a crushing blow. All of the knowledge acquired in these schools was put to the ultimate test in an armored duel.
With the rise of firearms at the end of the Middle Ages, the interest in close combat styles taught by the medieval masters began to fade away. However, in dozens of surviving manuscripts, the master's teachings have been preserved into the present. Today, modern schools like the Higgins Armory Sword Guild study these manuscripts in order to reconstruct historical fighting styles. Through these long forgotten texts, contemporary scholars and practitioners can once again study these lost martial arts and journey along the path of the medieval warrior.